If you live or work with teenagers, you probably know firsthand how difficult it can be to connect with them sometime. Now, they can be impulsive, secretive, and moody. Someone once said that raising teenagers is like trying to nail jello to a tree. But one man has taken on this challenge seriously. Dan Blanchard is an author and speaker on motivating teens and a school teacher in Connecticut's largest inner city high school. He's the author of Granddaddy Secrets, a teen leadership book series that defines the importance of one generation passing wisdom to the next. Mr. Blanchard is a former two-time junior Olympian wrestler and has co completed 12 years of college, earning him seven degrees in the field of education. Welcome to the show, Dan. Well, thank you, Bill. Now, you uh, were obviously working in the school system and have probably one of the closest contacts with teenagers mm -hmm. in probably some of the toughest situations because I would assume you have no idea where they come from, what kind of situations, neighborhoods, or families they come from. Yeah. And that really, although you could probably use that information uh, in your job, but sometimes you don't even really know, mm -hmm. you've got to address the situation that you have in front of you in your classroom. So yeah. Yeah, tell, tell us a little bit uh, more about the background that you have with teens. Okay, Bill, I've, um, I've been an inner city school teacher for about 20 years now, over in, uh, right here in Connecticut. And uh, I've written a couple of teen leadership books, and I've been a coach of different sports, wrestling, and football, and some, uh, some powerlifting. So I've spent a lot of time with teens through the uh, public education, sports, through the coaching, and I also have five kids of my own now. So I've definitely spent a lot of time around kids, and I gotta tell you, it, it's never easy. It's never easy, but it's doable. It really is. Now, any of your kids' teens yet? No, but they certainly act like they are. <laughs> <laughs> how old is your How old is your oldest? Well, my oldest is twelve. Oh, okay. And and believe it or not, she's pretty much the easiest one. Is that right? It's the, it's the next one, the nine year old. That's a little more challenging and wants to be grown up overnight and wants to be the man of the house <laughs> and all that, which is you know something I see quite frequently <clears throat> in the inner city when dealing with uh, teen boys. Uh, some of them, unfortunately, don't have father figures, so right from an early age, they're like the man of the house. Uh, you know, and they could be like five, six, seven, eight years old, and they're the man of the house. And then when you get them as a teenager, they've been in the man of the house for a while. And now you're gonna tell them what to do, and they're gonna look at you like you're crazy. You know, I'm the man of the house, you ain't telling me what to do. So you start butting heads. You know, and this is, this is quite frequent, uh, probably in all places, but particularly the middle city. So you've got a couple of books out, you're working on a few more, and the, what originally started the idea with you writing the books was, like in your book was all about, and what I got out of it, and, and we had conversation previously, yeah. it's all about passing wisdom down from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I, I agree with you, I think it's so important, I think unfortunately, with this day and age, with parents being so busy, I think we've lost that the, the storytelling, right? Yes. We've lost that from mm -hmm. generations. Because I know I'm, when I was a kid, I'd sit around my grandparents to tell us stories, but mm -hmm. this doesn't seem to happen that much anymore. No, it, it doesn't. And I think one of the reasons why it doesn't happen is because it takes time. I mean, to tell a good story, it, it takes a lot more time than just saying, read this paragraph and answer this question. So and it seems like today's trend uh, in, in education, today's trend in society, is that you know, everybody's so busy everywhere that you're trying to maximize the impact and you're trying to shove information down people's throats and then saying, spit it back at me. Do you know it? Did you get it? And I mean, it's tough to perform on that because what happens is, I mean, you need time for that to sink in. So it's hard to just spit stuff back and act like you really got it except that you just spit it back. I mean, you didn't really get it. Whereas with a story, uh, you can listen to a story and you can get it on one level. But then maybe later on when you're laying in bed that night trying to fall asleep, it's sinking in on a different level. Maybe a couple years later, it's sinking in on a, di a much deeper, different level. And this is like takes time to do this. And we're in such a, you know, a, a hurry up society today that unfortunately I think storytelling has lost. And, and, and it's not so easy to measure you know, the results of a story. It's much easier to measure two plus two equals four. You know, so it's like, but what's important to know is that we, uh, <clears throat> We've lost the art of storytelling, I think, a lot because entertainment back then was storytelling. Mm, but now we've got video and movies and computers yeah. and the internet, and I think that's replaced a lot of the time that uh, w was used yeah. in passing wisdom down through storytelling. I think you're going to have to be very good at storytelling today if you're going to keep uh, t teens' attention or pretty much anybody's attention exactly for the reasons you're saying. You're competing with a whole array of things, and it's, it's tough, but it's worth the effort. So you specialize in, well, you have a lot of expertise in, in teens. 
parents who are watching this show are going to be looking for some some mm -hmm. advice. So, so what do you what what advice do you have for parents on how to get teens to listen? I, there's never an easy way to do this, and I've had parents that have come to me in uh, parent-teacher conferences or have pulled me across, uh, up, up to the side, and, and we've talked a little bit, and I've seen the frustration uh, in their faces for years and years. I've seen the frustration. You know, my kid won't listen to me. I tell my kid this. He does the opposite. You know, goes in one ear, out the other. You don't always get this, and, and one of the things I, I tried to tell them is, is, is relax. Listen, believe it or not, they're getting it. They're hearing you. They're just acting like they're not hearing you. So the worst thing you could do right now is to give up, you know, to go into like a combative mode. You can't go into a combative mode. You gotta stay in the love mode. And you have to just keep giving them that message over and over again, even though maybe it feels like it's the millionth time you've given that message. Give it to them again. Give it to them again. Give it to them through, you know, warmth and love and just give it to them again and realize that they are listening and that at some point they're gonna turn around and say, I remember when you said, and I can't count how many times I've been witness <laughs> to that. <laughs> uh, you know what's interesting is in my, in my work with uh, children and parents, when I was uh, getting my degree, I realized uh, one thing I learned was that in, when they get into adolescence years, they actually develop an allergy to the parents. <laughs> Uh, yes. Because and why? Because we, yeah. we know why. Uh, in, in adolescent years, especially in early early adolescent years, they, they have to shed their baby image to grow yeah. psychologically. Yeah. Well, guess who's attached to the baby image? Yeah, parents. Yep. Parents, absolutely. And so that makes them not want to be with you. Makes you dumb and stupid, and you know your embarrassment, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. So that makes it even more challenging. True. But um, what about what about school? How do we get how do we get uh, how do we get teens to do better in school? And from your perspective, you're the you're the teacher yeah. talking into parents, talking to parents. What would you say? Well, I, I would say if I'm the teacher talking to a parent, one of the things that I always come up with is that you got to have a set homework time at home that's like unnegotiable. You know, whether it's right when the kid gets off the bus, they've got an hour of doing homework, and then they can get on their electronics or go out and play or have dinner or go to the ball games or whatever it is. I mean, it has to be a time, obviously, that works. If the kid does sports after school, then maybe it's after dinner. But there has to be a set homework time that's like non-negotiable. They get out there and they do that homework, and of course they're gonna fight that. I left my book in school. I didn't have any homework. Teacher gave me homework, but I finished it real quick. It was easy. Oh, good, all right, then here, you give them a book. You have books and magazines ready for them. And you say, here, you have an hour of homework. And if you're not gonna do your teacher's homework, you're gonna do mine. So you give them that hour of homework of extra reading. And then sooner or later, if they are indeed blowing off their teacher's homework, sooner or later they're gonna say, mom and dad are making me do this anyways. So I might as well just do the homework that I've been blowing off. And if for some reason they have been getting it done in school or getting it done elsewhere, the extra hour a night of reading is gonna do nothing but help them. So you're doing them a favor. You know, that's <laughs> really, I really agree with you on that. And I, I'm always uh, <coughs> advising parents, you, you make the homework time in concrete, it happens. Yeah. Now, of course, it's difficult because you got some nights are soccer yeah. practice and baseball, but you got to have that homework time happen every night. And here's an additional thing that I tell parents: a parent's job during homework time is to eliminate the distractions. Mm. To the, it's their job to yeah. to get the kids to sign out or sign yeah. in the uh, the cell phones and the mm -hmm. the computers and the handheld devices if possible. Because yeah. what I've discovered yeah. is, if the child comes home, they've got a really tough homework assignment. And they're thinking, oh, I don't want to do that. And you know what? I'd rather play with the Nintendo for a while or my Xbox. <laughs> sure. What's to stop them from going, I have no homework tonight. And then at 9, 30, 10 o'clock, they go, oh, I got homework. Because yeah. they wanted to play the Xbox time. But, it, yeah. but if parents instill this guideline, this mandatory guideline, no home, no uh, internet or, ele or yeah. entertainment electronics between like 4 and 6 or something mm -hmm. like that. On Monday through Thursday, Monday through Thursday, yeah. even if there's no homework, that's yeah. the hardest thing because, you know, you know and, and, and if they go, but that's not fair, I don't have homework. Great, read. <laughs> read, I got exactly. some reading assignments for we'll you, give you a right? good old-fashioned book. Yeah. <laughs> so in, in, the, in, the, in, in <laughs> introducing you when we were coming on the show, you have seven degrees? I'm getting yeah. stressed just thinking about that with the degrees I went through. How did you yeah. end up in, it, in it, just a couple minutes, but how did you end up with seven degrees? Well, I was never a good student, so uh, I was a typical C student in high school. And out of high school, I went to the service. And when I came back from the service, 
I, I was like, okay, now it's time to go to school and to focus. And I used some of that energy, then discipline that I got from previous sports and the military. And I said, it's time to focus on college. And I focused on college and I got good grades for the first time. And that just fed into uh, getting a degree. And then I, then I got another degree and another degree. And it was just like, it, it, the good grades just kind of kept that momentum and kept building that self-esteem in me. And it's like, I couldn't stop. I just kept going. Do you have any advice for teachers? What about the teachers that are kind of burnt out? Uh, they're they're oh, not having yes. as much success yeah. as you have had. What would you What would you say to other mm. high school teachers? I would say it's not your fault <laughs> that you're burnt out because it's one of the most demanding jobs that people are unaware of. Most people don't realize how demanding it is. I'd say you have to change your paradigm in the way you're looking at your class. Uh, they're, they're not going to do the things you want them to do. But if you reach out to them with kindness, and no matter what they do, and you work on that relationship with them, no matter what they do, you know, you send little postcards, little letters to their home, you know, no matter what they do, you do these things for them, and you're gonna put yourself in better spirits, and then that can't, the students aren't gonna be able to help but notice that, and they're gonna wanna be around you, and they're gonna wanna start working for you. It may not happen overnight, but at some point, they're gonna look at you differently and say, man, I've been pushing at this teacher, and this teacher's still in my corner. And then all of a sudden, you know what, they'll start going through brick walls for you. So be as kind as you can be, and, and no matter what happens, always put that smile on your face, and build that relationship, and then you'll see, you'll start feeling better inside, regardless of what you're facing. And, and Brian Tracy, a uh, <sighs> uh, very famous salesperson, said, people don't care how much you know, they wanna know mm. how much you care. And so I think true. that goes right along with what you're saying. So true. And I've oftentimes told teachers, you know, children and teens are affected by adult emotional chaos. That means mm -hmm. if a teacher walks into the classroom stressed out about stuff, then it's going to transmit into the kids as well and make it difficult. Yeah. Look, you've got a really d difficult job, and I'm so glad that you're doing what you're mm -hmm. doing because we need more teachers like you who are really... Uh, really want to make a change with, with teenagers in school and, mm -hmm. and uh, keep doing what you're doing. I thank you so much for coming out to the thank show you. today. Thank you, Bill. The job of parenting is not easy and it's common for parents to get stressed out trying to manage the house, the kids, activities, and everything else. Now coming up after the break, we're going to meet an expert who can help us all with this very problem. Don't go away. We'll be right back.